Hello, my name is Narses Begian. I'm head of data science at Raiffeisen Bank CIB. And today at advanced A-B testing section, we are going to discuss advanced A-B testing. We will talk about picking at A-B tests and how we could solve this problem. I will tell you about statistics behind it and the way how you will solve it. Let's start with statistics. In A-B testing and online experimenting, everything is based on statistical tests and hypothesis testing. The null hypothesis says that effect, which is the difference in average of two metrics, does not exist. And the alternative hypothesis says that the effect exists. It could be small or big, positive or negative, but it exists. So in this slide you could see a two way to uh, write down the null and alternative hypothesis. I propose to remember the second one and move on. I want to discuss with you how to conduct uh, an A-B testing in fixed horizon setup. We could divide all A-B testing process in three parts. The first one we calculating our sample size, the second one we are waiting uh, A-B test to end, uh, and after we got our observations, we calculate p-values, this magical number which tells us if we should reject or not reject our null hypothesis. But what is p-value? If we are talking with a person who doesn't know statistics very good, um, he will say that the smaller p-value, the, uh, the better it is for us. He will be right, but uh, as far as we are on uh, advanced A-B testing section, I want you uh, to provide uh, some mathematics behind it. And uh, this magical value, which is called p-value, could be defined in two ways. The first one is classical definition from the Wikipedia, and it says that p-value is the probability of uh, obtaining the same statistics or even more critical one uh, if the null hypothesis is true, and alternative definitions tells us that uh, p-value is the smallest alpha, uh, which is a type 1 error rate, and if we want our p definitions to work, we should know that there is such a thing as uh, valid p-values. What does it mean? Valid p-values are uh, p-values that have a super uniform distribution. Uh, in fact, this is uh, not very popular definition when we are talking about super, super uniform distribution. So let's understand what does it mean practically. What does it mean that our p-values have super uniform distribution under null hypothesis? And it could mean two things. The first one is uh, that our distribution is right skewed. And the second one is that our distribution is uniform. Uh, so when you conduct a thousand of AA tests, uh, um, you should uh, see the distribution that is either right skewed or uniform. And let's get back to our uh, p-values and statistical tests and uh, look uh, more precisely at our second definition. We see that there is a some decision threshold, k alpha. And I want to show you how does this threshold looks like uh, in a real A-B testing setup. And here I want to show you how this decision boundary works, how it looks like. Um, we see that there are two black lines which represent uh, our fixed horizon decision boundary. The red line which shows the effect by we obtain uh, some number of observations. And if we look precisely, we will see that sometimes our effect uh, crosses our decision boundary. And if we pick it this, this time, the test will say that the effect exists, even if we see that in the end our A-B test showed us that the null hypothesis is true. So why our statistics cross the decision boundary uh, several, several times? Why does it happen? There is such thing as law of iterated logarithm 
that says uh, that under null hypothesis uh, with probability one, uh, our st statistic uh, or uh, our effect will cross the decision boundary because it's proportional to uh, square of log log n divided of n, which is asymptotically bigger than one divided square of n. And what does this mean to us? What should we know about this? And uh, I think that we should understand that uh, we will eventually exceed this decision threshold and it will lead to 100% type 1 error rate. Uh, and someone could say, sorry nurses, uh, do you really want to say that we should conduct A-B test uh, with infinite uh, sample size? And uh, he will be correct. In practice, uh, when we are fixing the number of observation to 10,000 and uh, we continuously monitoring it and we stop the test the first time we see uh, the, the effect exists, it will lead us to 50% type 1 error rate, which is very bad. Imagine that in your company you will come to your supervisor and say to him that the effect exists, that you see the real money in, in the A-B test when it doesn't exist. I, I think it will be very, very bad to you and your company because uh, you, it could lead to the wrong decisions and uh, in the end uh, you could be fired. We don't want that, so there are at least four ways how to handle th this problem and uh, I think they're, they're very interesting and let's go through them. The first one is setting alpha at a very low level, but it will result in very, uh, very small uh, power uh, of your test. Uh, so you will not de detect the effect when it exists. The second and the third way to handle this are very similar. It's using biasing A-B testing and multi-armed bandits. But we're not going to discuss them today because there are a lot of materials which uh, will show us how to deal with them. Today I want to tell you about sequential testing. It's a very popular way in uh, some companies how to continuously monitor um, A-B testing without inflating type 1 error rate. Actually, sequential tests in statistics is a family of decision rules which uh, tells us when to stop the test. Uh, and it parameterizes by two things. The first one is t, it's the sample size when the test is ended. And the second one is delta, which is binary valued variable that uh, takes value of one uh, when null hypothesis is rejected and uh, zero otherwise. And so we could reformulate our valid p-value calculation process in the following way. Uh, we will say that it is the smallest alpha when our uh, sample size, t of alpha, is smaller than n and delta is 1. I think that it's pretty hard to understand, but do this kind of decision rules, t and delta, are, even exist? And this is, this is a question I want to answer. And they do exist. One of these tests is called Mixture Sequential Probability Ratio Test, uh, first introduced by Herbert Robbins in 1975. He proposed a way to calculate a new statistics uh, using a likelihood probability ratio test uh, with some prior distribution on the test effect. Given this statistic, we could easily calculate uh, our decision rules and uh, after that, decide uh, to stop or not to stop the test. And you could uh, just say, wait, what happened? What did you just tell us? We just absurd uh, simple things and let's go through them one by one. We defined uh, s some statistics, some, some value that we could recalculate once we got a new observation. How can we do that? 
so we upgraded a likelihood probability ratio test by thinking Bayesian. Uh, we added a prior distribution on, on the effect um, and uh, moved to some probability uh, mixture, mixture of probability distributions instead of just looking at uh, and using simple uh, likelihood probability ratio testing. The third thing that we did is we defined a decision rule for stopping the test. We also could uh, define how to calculate p-value for a valid p-value process and it sim simply uh, is 1 divided by uh, statistics lambda. And uh, actually our statistics lambda, if we are talking about some intuition there, represents the evidence uh, against null hypothesis in favor of mixture of alternative hypotheses. And if we accumulated enough evidence, I think it means that we could uh, reject null hypothesis and uh, uh, say that the effect exists. And the last question uh, you probably want to ask me is uh, how to find likelihood function and prior distribution. And the answer is simple. You should use your historical data and uh, find such distributions that fit your data best. And let's hear some story from galaxy far, far away. Um, there is some analytic uh, which works in a big company and uh, his supervisor, let's call him manager, and the analytics co comes to his manager and say, hi, I saw you just assigned a task, task to me. Uh, you want to conduct an A-B test? and I should calculate a sample size in advance. Could you please answer some questions in order for me to finish this task? Manager says, yeah, okay. Analytics say, uh, do you know something about expected effect in the test? Some sort of, did you do some sort of calcula calculations? And uh, his supervisor says, yeah, maybe from 1% to 3% to uh, in conversion rate. Uh, and the analytics says, hmm, thank you. Why is he so sad? Because uh, to detect an effect of size delta takes a run length proportional to 1 divided by delta squared. It means that uh, when we are talking about effect from 1 to 3% in conversion rate, the run uh, length could result in from 4 to 9 times longer than it should be. When we discussed this fact, I propose you to move on and discuss the result of performance of MSPRT. There are three cases. When we know the exact effect, which is never when we are mistaken in our effect size by 30%, it will lead to 20 percent longer runtime compared to fixed horizon testing. And when we are mistaken by 50 percent, it shows us that we could be two times faster. What does it mean? You could say, uh, sorry nurses, but you proposed us a way to make our experiment faster and continuously monitoring it. They actually say yes, and I just show, uh, show you how we could do this, because uh, in my experience, I never seen an A-B test when we knew the exact uh, effect before the A-B test. And when we are talking that the effect could vary from 1 to 3 percent, it means that we are uh, mistaken by uh, maybe 200 percent or 300 percent, and the MSPRT will be work better in this case. So MSPRT not only gives us an opportunity to continuously monitor our test, but also not to calculate the sample size before the A-B test. And actually this shows us that we are robust not to knowing the effect size and this results in shorter expected run lengths. Thank you. Uh, I hope this was interesting for you and you understand how to use MSPRT in your testing and you will use it.